Turner Network Television proudly presents the 1986 Goodwill Games from Moscow and from Madrid. Brought to you by Diet. Day five of the Goodwill Games, and our late-night coverage continues now. Marianne Laughlin, uh, we've got a show full of events tonight. A new sport started today, and we're going to have some coverage of that one. Yes, indeed. We have uh, highlights of today's rhythmic gymnastics uh, action. We're also we're going to be talking this hour with Evelyn Ashford, who won her second gold medal by anchoring the women's 4x100 relay. And, as always this hour, we try to have a special guest for you. And this hour, you get Steve Lundquist, who joins us. <laughs> Good morning, Steve. Good morning. Good morning, Moscow time. That's right. That's a very special guest. As a matter of fact, we're going to talk to Steve in a moment about the success of the U.S. swimming team, about uh, water polo, and a couple of curveball questions that he doesn't even know I'm going to ask him yet. We also just wanted to take a moment to remind you that tomorrow, Moscow time, is going to be another big day at the Goodwill Games. Women's basketball, the championship game, will be carried live on our daytime coverage between the Soviet Union and the United States. And in men's world basketball championship action tomorrow night on our primetime show, we'll have coverage of the undefeated 4-0 USA team versus the undefeated 4-0 Italian team. So a lot of action tomorrow too, but we'll be back with Steve Lundquist in just a moment. Stay with us. Back now with Steve Lundquist, the gold medalist from the 1984 Olympics, who's working with us on our coverage of the 1986 Goodwill Games. And Steve, you're on with us very early uh, in our coverage when the U.S. swimmers, the B team as they were called, and I ended up calling them the killer bees after <laughs> a while, right. uh, they were in the midst of surprising people. Now that they finished and won so many gold medals uh, in so many areas, uh, give us a little bit of your feeling about how this happened. I still haven't really got a good grasp of it. I hope we sent them to Spain. They were so good. Uh, that was our world championships in Spain. To tell you the truth, I think the thing that made our team so good was the team environment. And it's been so long since our team has been so close together. At the Olympics, we had the chance to get out of the dorms and, and be our own people. Essentially, here, we were able to stay with the athletes in a group, trade pins, do whatever we wanted to, but stay in that group. And that team environment for the United States, if you get the ball rolling, so to speak, it goes forever. Give me your reaction to this. It seems to me that when you take the top eight or nine swimmers of any major swimming power in, in world competition and take the top two or three and send them to the world championships and then you have four, five, six left. They are six, some of them are 17, 18 years old, amateurs. It seems to me that their times are so close that the competition at any given time, even a sixth place swimmer might actually beat the first place swimmer. Is that an, an, an actuality a fact? That is a fact because in the Olympics, if you make the Olympic team in the United States especially, you have a shot of winning a, a gold, silver, or bronze medal because our depth is so big. I remember at Olympic trials, I ended up fourth place at Olympic trials and I would have been in the top eight in the world world at the time. So I didn't make the Olympic team, but would have still been in the top eight. So our depth is very good and very strong. We just have to continue that dominance and that training and the, and the, and the expertise that our coaches have given us. Will some of these swimmers who swam in the 1986 Goodwill Games be on the U.S. Olympics team in 1988, in your opinion? I certainly hope so. These kids are wonderful kids, a lot of them in college. The, the girls are so young, they have a chance to mature even further on down the line. Uh, we've got two years before the Olympics, and these kids mature not only in swimming, but they mature as far as the press goes, and everything uh, advances in the sport. Uh, so I think they'll be filling uh, the shoes of the 1984 Olympic Games participants uh, very well. Since the swimming venue ended, you've had a chance to get around to some of the other venues, and I know you participated in something with some other athletes uh, that's very significant. Tell us about what that was. Well, there's a thing called the Athletes United for Peace, and that's a, a group of us who got together and decided, uh, actually, we did sign a, a peace treaty, so to speak. Uh, Arena Masivia and her husband, who won the, the Olympics in Lake Placid in figure skating, the pairs, and also Vladimir Salnikov and his girlfriend, they all signed it with the Olympic athletes. Willie Banks introduced this along with uh, Guy Benjamin, who was the San Francisco quarterback. Uh, it's essentially the thing, what, if you want me to read the contract, I will. Yeah, do. Uh, it's the athletes of the world joined together in the name of peace, utilizing the language of sport. Uh, in important sporting events is the Goodwill Games to bring people together 
in a matter that transcends politics, to share in our common experience and ideals of humanity. So in other words, this brings together uh, the world in a peaceful situation and using sport in that peace situation. That's a part of the Goodwill Games Tour, which went to uh, 21 cities, nine countries, and four continents. As you well know. Oh, boy, do I. Uh, we went on that tour. We saw over 50,000 kids. Wow. And uh, that's something special. Uh, an interesting story. We, had, uh, we went over to Italy, and I had a person who was uh, not supposed to live very much longer, dying of cancer. And we came and visited the hospital, and she said, uh, through your smiles and your enthusiasm, you've given me a reason to live. Worth the whole trip, I'm sure. It certainly was. I want to ask you, well, we just have a couple of minutes left here, but I want to ask you about the water polo that's going on right now. The U.S. team, one of the favorites to win water polo along with the West Germany and Soviet Union. I know you know a lot about that team and about the sport. What is your feeling? How strong are they and what are their shots here? <coughs> well, they're a young team, and I want to say young because young as far as playing with each other. We do have Terry Schroeder, Doug Burke returning from the uh, Olympic team who got second place. We just uh, fought it out, so to speak, with the Yugoslavians in America. We lost two and tied two, but uh, we just were in Europe with them and killed them. We really did well. And so uh, you're finding a team that's growing and learning together each day, not only each week, but in each month, but each day. And so the more experience you get in water polo, like basketball or any team sport, the better off you're going to be. So in other words, what you're saying is we've been saying that this is a very experienced U.S. Uh, water polo team, and you're saying the players are, but the combinations aren't necessarily, and so they're still growing in that area. That's right. Uh, another person that you might recognize, Matt Bionti, the world record in the 100 freestyle, the world record holder, uh, he came very close to making the Olympic team. He's a very talented guy, and uh, maybe if he's lucky, you might see him out there in a 88. Why aren't you playing water polo? <laughs> it's too tough. Uh, <laughs> the, the thing about water polo, it's, a, it's kind of a mix between uh, uh, hockey and, and soccer, essentially. Okay. You have penalty boxes. Uh, uh, it's very rough because another thing, another thing you can't see underneath the water. So there are a lot of egg beater kicks uh, that you don't see uh, into other competitors, as a matter of fact. The football of swimming. Maybe. It certainly <laughs> is. It's a very tough sport. Thanks for being with us. I'm Thank going to ask you. you to stick around for our entire late night hour. Will you do that? You bet. We'll continue <laughs> with our coverage of the Goodwill Games in a moment. Stay with us. Welcome back to our broadcast center as we continue our coverage of the Goodwill Games on our late night hour. Oh, well, it seems like just about every day that we've been here in Moscow, a new sport has started up, and today was no exception. We had the first day of competition for rhythmic gymnastics, and it's being held at the Olympic Sports Complex in the indoor stadium there. As you can see, it's just about north of the Kremlin. We're going to our play-by-play -play coverage now with our reporters, Leander Riley and Kathy Johnson. Hello and welcome to the Olympic Sports Complex and our first of nine days of gymnastics competition. The event that you are going to see tonight, though, is called Rhythmic Gymnastics, a little different than the games you saw in Los Angeles. In fact, speaking of the games in Los Angeles, let me bring in two-time Olympian Kathy Johnson, who picked up a couple of medals in gymnastics while she was in L.A. Well, I won my medals in a form of gymnastics that most people in the United States are a little more familiar with. That's so true. We're more familiar with the uneven parallel bars, the balance beam, and so forth. This form of gymnastics, as I said, is called rhythmic gymnastics. We have hand implements in this sport. We've all tossed a ball. We've all played with a ribbon. We've all maybe played with clubs even. But it's much more difficult than just playing with hand implements. It is so difficult. The girls each have a minute to a minute and a half on each routine to perform choreographed dance, pre-acrobatic skills, and those big tosses and catches which make it exciting. But what makes it unique is it's almost like going to the theater. They're so expressive. It's like combining music, choreography, and a little bit of circus. We're joining the competition in progress. The Soviet Union has dominated the field, so now let's take a look at one of their best, Galina Beloglazova. She is 19 years of age, one of the taller competitors at 5'6", 110 pounds. She began this sport at age 7. Although all the events are very similar in terms of choreography, each implement has characteristics of their own, as well as requirements. This is the rope event. You should watch for skipping moves. Right there, large jumps or leaps through the rope, as well as turns and balances, and of course those big tosses. 
The most important thing to remember in the rope event is that the rope should always look wire-like, never become limp, especially in the tosses. she's performing on is 40 by 40, which is similar to the floor exercise mat that we're used to seeing in regular gymnastics, but there is no padding underneath it. Now that move she just did right there is called a pre-acrobatic skill. They are not allowed to do more than three in a routine or there's a deduction. Why are they holding the sport back in that regard? Why do they not allow the difficult tumbling? Well, they, do, they really don't want it to be anything like artistic gymnastics, in which you see acrobatic skills, actually walkovers. That's also another rule. They can't pass through the vertical in any move upside down. Galina Beloglazova, two-time national champion. Her coach agrees with Galina in that the rope is her best event. We'll have to wait and see what her score is. Maria Martin, Espania. And we have just been given her score, a perfect 10. 10.0 10 for Bella Glazova of the USSR. Now moving on to the podium is a young lady from the USA, Marina Konyavsky. She was born in Leningrad, emigrated to the United States five years ago. She's 21 years of age. This is Marina's favorite event. And of all the events, this event requires the most hand-eye coordination. One of her strengths is that she is so quick with feet and hands. Marina is 5'1", weighs 98 pounds. that you perform two elements, it's of superior difficulty. Another very difficult move. Nice routine. Marino Konyavsky from the USA. She attends Santa Monica College. Only been in this country for five years, just moved out to the Los Angeles area to be with her coach, Alice Fersky, whom you see there. And we now have the score for Marina. She received a 9.8, which is the best score that the USA has received so far in this competition. Looking at Marina Lobach of the Soviet Union, 5'1", 84 pounds, just 16 years of age. Now, she currently has 29.9 points in the all-around competition and is in second place by one-tenth of a point. She trails one of her Soviet teammates, Druchinina. She is one of my favorite gymnasts here. She's so artistic and elegant. this event, you should look for fluid movements, and the ball should seem almost magnetic, like it never leaves the body. Oh, what a catch that was. Very difficult catch. That's a superior move. Oh, and look at that. She has such originality. That ball is smaller than a volleyball, larger than a softball. Oh. Flexibility. It's also a difficult move. She's 
which really shows off that back flexibility. It's an illusion. This is where she is so superb. A very dramatic finish for Marina Lobach. Remember, she is one-tenth of a point out of first place. She is currently in second place. The lady she is chasing is yet to come, Tatiana Druchinina. 29.9, she is one-tenth of a point away from perfect. And she has received a perfect 10.0, giving her a 39.9 average as we move to the USA's Diana Simpson, who's going to compete with the ribbon. Diana Simpson's from Evanston, Illinois, 17 years of age, five foot five, weighs 100 pounds. Diane has a very European style. And her strength is those long legs and flexibility. She's very expressive in her dance. Now in the ribbon event, there's certain requirements that they must meet. They have to show spirals, snakes, big circles, figure eights in all different planes, and show perfect technique in all. It's a high toss with a split link. Currently, Diana has 29.05 points. She needs a 9.75 to get into the finals. We are watching the all-around competition. The best all-around gymnasts will be selected from what you are watching here. The top eight in each implement will advance to tomorrow's competition. That was another high toss to a chest roll. Very nice Nicer routine. Team. Finishes with a smile. Seems she's pleased with her performance. She needs a 9.75 to make it into the finals in the ribbon like competition. Today we're awarding one gold medal. Tomorrow we'll award four. Ah, the score for Diana Simpson. Sad news, 9.70. Now it is time for our champion, Tatiana Druchinina. She has 30 points going into this event. Perfect. Three perfect tens. If she scores 9-9, she will tie with her teammate that you just saw, Marina Lobach. She needs a perfect score to win it outright. She has just been incredible in this competition. Every move is so perfect. And to match that perfection, she has the difficulty. Duchina is five feet one, 84 pounds. Look at the height of the leaps. Complete amplitude. I'm sure you're very aware when you go out on the floor what you need for a score. And when you know you need a perfect score, does that put added pressure on you? Oftentimes it does. But yet in this sport, it's so much of a performance that you can really get into, into playing to the crowd and to the judges. And being from the Soviet Union, she's got a nice crowd to play to. Oh, they're behind her 100%. Beautiful exercise. She is pleased with it, and that very well might be worth 10 points. Mm -hmm. It is. It's a perfect 10.0, and this is our winner, Tatiana Druchinina of the Soviet Union. When pressed, she performed. By one-tenth of a point, she is our leader. She wins it with a perfect 40 average. Marina Lobach finishes second with a 39.9, and five hundredths of a point behind her is Galina Belglazova. Diane Simpson of the USA finished 12th as the best USA finisher. The other U.S. gymnasts finished 15th and 19th.
we all agree here that, that is just gorgeous to watch, although I've always insisted it's easier to do when you weigh 84 pounds. <laughs> I would think so. <laughs> although, uh, you know, interestingly, one of the things that's said about rhythmic gymnastics is that it's a combination of floor exercise and ballet, of course, and that the more mature gymnast, uh, uh, women who have uh, performed gymnastics when they were teenagers, as they get a little older, they get into this kind of movement with the, with the dance music, with the ballet, the floor exercise. I wanted to ask Steve something, because as everybody watched that, particularly if you're watching the United States, of course, most of our, our audience is, uh, you might be wondering about the Soviets getting the high scores and the U.S. getting the lower, the, is, the, is the judging biased here. But Steve, you made a very good point about judges usually not being biased, and I thought maybe you could repeat it. Well, not only the, the judges from the, the Soviet Union, but they're from America as well Certainly. and everywhere else. So the, I, it's really hard to say that there's bias. Uh, the main thing is the Americans always look for, for flair, and, that, and, and a lot of the American viewers, that's all they look for. They don't look for the technical aspect of the sport. They look for the dancing aspect yes. that, rather than the, the preciseness. Yes, and, and, and I think that sometimes it, to us, you know, we, we're looking for that flair, and that's all that counts to us, and, and you'll see that in diving as well. Uh, I, the, the neatest thing I ever saw was they did this. Vidal Sassoon did a tour with the Olympic athletes afterwards, and the uh, they gym, the rhythm, rhythmic gymnastics, and uh, they did this in black light colors and 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 glow in the dark uh, colors for the ribbons and that type of thing. Very very beautiful. Well, Steve, uh, we're going to come back in just a moment. Uh, Marianne is uh, going to rejoin us to talk about Stu Lurie's piece, his My Moscow report. You stay with us, and we'll continue right after this. Moscow for the Goodwill Games to have a real expert show us the sights and sounds of the city. CNN's Moscow bureau chief, Stu Lurie, has been running a series of reports for us called My Moscow. And tonight, he takes a look at a certain aspect of the town. He uh, explores the differences between the old and the new in the world of architecture here. The travel posters show Moscow as a city of peppermint-striped onion domes or the Red Star top towers of the Kremlin. That was the ancient architecture of this city. Today, the architecture is somewhat different for the most part. It's very monotonous. Western artists and writers know and disdain Moscow as the capital of socialist realism the cultural straitjacket that ties the arts to political ideology. But for a few years in the 1920s, Moscow was one of the avant-garde centers of the art world. And the home of Konstantin Milnikov, a 1920s architect, survives to tell the story. The design was two intersecting cylinders perforated with 127 windows in the rear and one huge picture window in the front. Melnikov could work in his studio, and even a pencil would not cast a shadow on his designs. He had five feverish years of work in Moscow, designing a series of workers' clubs intended as substitutes for churches in this atheistic society. The Rusikov Workers' Club is a textbook example of the idea that form follows function, the concept that is the foundation of modern architecture. Melnikov's success gave him the right to build and live in this huge private house when others in Moscow lived five and six families together in communal apartments. As the house was going up, he and his wife might have been mistaken for capitalistic flappers in the jazz age. Today, the Melnikov's son, Victor, lives alone in the house. He's an artist on a modest pension surrounded by his own mementos and those of his parents. The intimate ground floor dining room is a clutter of books and paintings. After Constantine designed a club for a porcelain factory, the grateful workers made him a plate with his portrait as a gift. A rear hallway has become a little seen display of Melnikov's designs. Today, Victor Melnikov maintains the house as a museum and hopes that it will soon be declared a national landmark. The whole family slept in this one bedroom. Today, a dull wallpaper covers the walls and the partitions. Once it was a rhapsody in yellow and bright red, as this study suggests. The color went out of the Milnikov's life in 1930, when Joseph Stalin turned on modern architecture, decreeing ornate classical forms to use. Milnikov never had another of his designs built. He died in 1974. 
Stalin knew what he wanted in building design, and his architects tried hard to give it to him. He was a man who had to be pleased. In the 1930s, Stalin was given an elevation for the front of the Moskva Hotel. The architects had two ideas for the facade, and Stalin was expected to choose one or the other, the ornate design on the left or the more simple right-hand L. Not understanding and not noticing, the dictator simply marked the plan OK and signed his name. No one had the fortitude to tell Joseph Stalin that he had made a mistake. And that's how a two-faced building came to be built across the street from the Kremlin. Architecture can tell you a lot about a society. I'm Stuart Lurie. That's my Moscow. And Stuart will be telling us even more about this society as the days and weeks go by throughout the games. Thank you to Stuart. Back to you, Bob. We're about to go check in on the triple jump at Lenin Stadium now. The Soviets have a strong field, including Nikolai Musienko, and, of course, from the United States, uh, Charlie Stemkins, the current American record holder, and Mike Connolly are in the competition. So let's go to Lenin Stadium for the triple jump. Dr. Leroy Walker joins me for the men's triple jump. Willie Banks, the world record holder at 58 feet, 11 and a half inches, not in this event. The current and former European record holder is in the event. Now, you're looking right now at Charlie Simpkins of the United States. He's already had two fouls and one jump of 56 feet, six and a half inches. He was the tack champ, 58 feet, nine and a half inches. That was wind dated. If it was no wind, it would have been the second best jump of all times. Let's watch Charlie Simpkins. Charlie has a good runway. His approach is easy. He's got good speed, good horizontal movement. That is not one of the best jumps for him because he usually gets a little bit more height off of his uh, last phase. There are three phases of this jump. Well, you see, he hits 56 feet, two inches. Let's watch it. Talk about the three phases, Dr. Walker. This is a tough event. It's really grueling. He's got good movement, good speed down the runway. Off the board nicely, a little bit too high in his step, but he's got good movement and good control. And you can see he gets a little out of sync there on his uh, last phase, which took away a lot on his extension and cost him dearly. Well, Charlie grew up in Aiken, South Carolina. He was practicing the triple jump one day when a coach suggested he might do better if he had a new pair of sneakers. Well, he did. Let's take a good world profile look at Charlie Simpkins. thing the triple jump to me is getting prepared for it it's, it's a mental edge to me what when the world is looking at me and I hit a crowd hollering what I usually do is put on my Walkman and cut it up and the volume up so I won't hit a crowd and it helped me get in my own mental world so you know I just blocked the outside world off when I was in high school um, you had to roll a, a I'm a cool guy and I'm such and such and I want to be my own person I want to be out of the ordinary so I feel well, I'm going to jump in some shoes, you know, and I picked my sneakers and I picked my shoe strings and my color, my socks. I felt like that could be my trend for me. Maybe I could start a trend, maybe not, but, you know, I didn't know nothing about shoes. As I started to run trike and, you know, get different shoes from different companies, I started to learn shoes more. And, um, and I know the manager and after that, added, he wasn't a part owner of him and Jimmy Carnes. And I was talking with him one day, and, um, he, and uh, he asked me to work because he felt that I knew a little more about shoes than most people. You know, that in, to, in a sense, that is true. Since I train, and I run with different shoes, and I, you know, I choose what shoe I want to run in. It's funny that I know so much about shoes now, but back then I didn't know <laughs> one single thing. I love to cook. This is just, like a hobby for me. I like to cook nice dishes and eat it. So I like to eat a lot anyway. And, um, you know, I invite some of my friends over, say, come over, let's have dinner, you know, like let maybe grill some steaks or you know, just shoot the bull and play cards or something like that. If it's nice outside like the weather is being here lately. I probably go bowling or I just go out and walk around, go to the park, just sit out on the balcony. Or, you know, maybe I go visit someone or something like that. I think a lot of Willie Banks, I give him great respect, but ironically, he's my um, hero. I look up to him as a great athlete, but then again, I don't say, well, he the best and I can't beat him. I don't look at it like that. I feel that I could beat him. 
it, it'll be very hard to break the world record there. I think about it a lot, but I believe within the next two to three years it will break. And um, I think it's possible to do it. It's just like people say, well, nobody never run a four minute mile. But you know, you, you never say never. You say it's almost impossible. You know, it take, it take an exceptional athlete to do it. When I go to Goodwill Games um, this summer, I'm looking to do really well. The competition over there, I know it's going to be really steep. And it's gonna, I know it's going to be at its best, and I would like to win. Well, the 22-year-old Simpkins has shown remarkable improvement the past couple of years, but today, not one of his better days. Meanwhile, we're going to look at Nikolai Musienko. He's the European record holder at 58 feet, 4 inches. He set that last month in Leningrad. This is his fourth jump. Nikolai is like the typical Europeans. Great boundary movement, fast off the board, the old sun head type. And generally, they get a little bit more height, a little bit more extension, Charlie. And most of them seem to be having trouble after the third phase of the hop, step, and the jump phase. How about the runway speed? How important? It's very important. You've got to have good movement because you've got to have so much momentum to hold your horizontal pace. I notice he's coming down good drive, not a lot of height as you would in the, in the high jump because you've got to get your horizontal movement first. But to look at that bounding and just not rushing it at all to get through, and that is a very good technical jump. He jumps 56 feet, 10 and a quarter inches. He takes the lead from Crystal Marco, the former European record holder. He's got Marco's number for some reason or other. Now you're looking at Mike Conley of the United States, who up to this point has had only one fair jump. That was 54 feet, 11 and a half inches, which is not that good. Now, Mike has great speed also. You know, he can run awfully good uh, 200s and 100s. He controls it well. He's got good movement down the runway. Good balance, good balance, excellent balance in all three of his phases. Well, that's 58 feet, one half inch, and uh, that takes first place right now. We talk about this young man, Mike Conley. He jumped 58, six and a half, wind aided at TAC, and becomes the first person to jump over 58 feet and lose. He finished second to Simpkins at TAC. He hasn't jumped in a couple of weeks in competition. You think that has uh, hurt him. It didn't seem to hurt him on that jump. Though. Well, it hurt him in his earlier rounds getting started, which is how, why he got those fouls in. Now, Mike has good speed and good movement, nice, even pace, nice balance, takes off with his left foot, which he uses in this, in this jump, but his right foot in the long jump, and has good, complete movement. Okay, that 58 feet, one half inch, gives him first place. It stands. Markov, Musienko, and Simpkins can't catch up. Mike Conley, the former NCAA double champ in the long and triple jump out of Arkansas. The triple jump gold medal here at the Goodwill Games, 58 feet, one half inch. Crystal Markov of Bulgaria gets the silver. Nikolai Musienko gets the bronze. Charlie Simpkins finished fourth. Well, the triple jump and the win by the American athlete was just uh, another example of how well uh, our U.S. athletes are doing in track and field. And earlier today, we talked to one of the brightest American stars, Evelyn Ashford. She talked with our Nick Charles about her latest success. Evelyn Ashford is with us, gold medal winner, Goodwill Games medal winner. Evelyn, you came to Moscow and got a little more than you bargained for. You. When I came, I thought I was only going to do the 4x1 relay and possibly the 200 because it was a Grand Prix event. And uh, when I got here, I was told that Pam Marshall had a slight groin injury and they asked me if I wanted to run. I slept on it overnight. I didn't know if I wanted to run or not. I didn't think I was ready. But I'm glad I made the decision because it was a confidence booster for me, this being my first year back, to come out and run 1091. Who was that East German, Heike Drexler? That's right. Who is that masked woman? I don't know. <laughs> I haven't seen her. She's a long jumper, and she's running tremendously well. So tremendously. it really took a supreme effort, huh? Yeah, for me. And I'm happy it came out the way it did. Tell me about the 4x100 and recall it for us. Uh, my impression, our first leg is a very young lady named Michelle, and uh, this is her first major competition. I thought she did quite well. Our second leg, uh, Diane Williams, supreme effort. I mean, she was, gave us a, a very good lead. 
And I think our third leg, I don't know, she didn't get around the turn too well. She didn't get out fast enough for the, for the pass. And then, uh, we come to then we come to me, and I see a Russian in front of me, <laughs> and a Russian to the right of me. And uh, I just wanted to, to catch her and, and, and get ahead. Can you describe and really in detail what that's like, that feeling of sheer speed, and what it's like to pull away and win in a race of this proportion? What I do if I have to pass someone is not focus on the person, focus on, on lifting my hips and running fast. And when you pass someone like that, after you've been behind, you get a surge of, of power. You feel very, very powerful, like you can do anything. Uh, I can't describe it. It's, it's, you can't describe it. Felt invincible, huh? Felt invincible, yeah. yeah. What about the experience in Moscow? It has been an experience. I've been to Russia before, and I did know what to expect. Uh, it's harder on the younger athletes because they don't know how to, to get over the jet lag and the not being able, being awake when they should be asleep so and all those things. Uh, it's part of being a world-class athlete. It's part of a, making an adjustment. You have to be able to adjust to be a world-class athlete. You had a baby 14 months ago. What continues to drive you now on track? I still love the speed. You were asking me about how does it feel, the sheer speed, and I'm, I'm, I really, I really love that, the feeling of running very fast. It feels like you're flying. I love that. So as long as I enjoy it and I'm running well, I'll continue to run. Evelyn Ashford, true champion. Thank you. Thanks for being with us. All right. Hi, Raina. <laughs> hey, you snuck that in. Okay. It's a pleasure. Really, right. you're, a, you're a, really a champion. Thank what you. a lady. I Thank mean you. that. Thank you. Quite a lady. Evelyn Ashford. Uh, Steve Lundquist was just telling me a quick story. I wanted to repeat about that, about the name. Evelyn Ashford's name of her child is Raina. There's another famous uh, runner who has a child with a similar name. Yes, Mary Decker Slaney. Uh, had a kid in the same day, same name, and uh, I just saw, as a matter of fact, a picture in Newsweek of those two. That's a fascinating story. You know, interestingly, you can tell by the interview that Nick did with Evelyn that Evelyn Ashford is a mature woman. She is, she's got a good grip on where she's going, what she needs to do to win. However, as you mature in track and field swimming amateur athletics, as soon as that happens, a new gunslinger comes to town. Always. Pam Marshall in the 100 meter, in the 200 meter. Isn't that interesting? I, I call them bonsai pilots. In other words, they have nothing to lose, everything to gain to beat you. You know, you always try to tell the little kids, hey, cool out. You know, give me a few more years, and it never works. They're always after you again. Just as sure as they come in bed. I wanted to ask you one other question about the track and field. We had mentioned we had seen the triple jump uh, just a mm -hmm. moment ago, and we saw Mike Conley won that, win that. One of the goodwill ambassadors who toured around the world promoting these games, and a man who wanted to perform here very badly, was Willie Banks. He did not jump in the triple mm -hmm. jump, and, and you can illuminate that, sir. <clears throat> well, Willie Banks, uh, his ankle has been somewhat shattered. He has been in every competition. He gave me the list the other day, and it was, uh, would cover this full desk. Uh, he's had a rough year. Uh, some, some people say it's just be the year. You know, some people have up years and down years, that type of thing. But he has hurt his ankle. So what he's going to do after this competition is go home, rest up, and see if he can maybe compete in the last half of the season. I don't think he's going to be able to. Uh, I'm going to talk with him this afternoon. Uh, hopefully he will, but uh, much continued success to him uh, and, and recovery for him. Willie Banks was one of the Goodwill Ambassadors. I met him back in Detroit when that tour started. Yes. What an effervescent young man, too. I'm sorry he's not here with us to, to be chatting with us. We're going to come back in just a moment and wrap up actions for you tonight on our late-night coverage of the Goodwill Games from Moscow. Please return with us. My favorite part of our late night show is our Goodwill Trivia phrase game. Marianne and Steve, yeah. tonight's phrase is something, I'll give you both a hint on this. This is something that, that uh, Steve might say to a beautiful young lady like yourself or anyone else that he really has some our hopes care up, for. <laughs> and the, uh, here's the word. I'll, I'll pronounce it once again in, in impeccable Russian dialect. Good luck. Yet to bien, you bleu. That's the, the phrase. Yet to bien, le bleu. And you could, there are a lot of songs that have been written about it, and we'll come back and uh, tell you what it is right now as we take a look. Here it comes. Any, anybody want to choose to venture a guess? Well, they get another Steve? Clue. Give us a clue. How about a guess? Um, yeah, to gosh, guess. I wish I knew. I, actually, I do have the answer, but I can't say right now. Okay, give the really audience know. a hint. The answer is, I love you in Russian. I can only say, 
I can, I think I can say words like, I can open your door with a refrigerator, or I love you. I've learned a couple of key words, so I find that I love you helps get by a lot of things. A lot easier. It's in the spirit of the Goodwill Games, and we find that it works pretty well. Uh, before we uh, have to close up our coverage of the Late Night Show, I wanted to take this opportunity to ask Steve one more question about diving, which starts tomorrow, the three-meter springboard. Uh, the U.S. diving team is also relatively unknown compared to the team in the 1984 Olympics particularly. Greg Louganis will not be here for the diving competition, but remember the U.S. swimming team was likewise. Uh, what do you expect? First of all, tell us about Greg Louganis. He won't be here, and we were disappointed, he, of course. The reason he won't be here, uh, from what I heard, is that he had a prior engagement. Uh, the reason the, the rest of the team is here, because they want to compete against the Russians for the first time, the Soviets, excuse me, for the first time in many years. Uh, I think it's going to be a great competition. The divers are, are somewhat older than, than, the, than the swimmers, uh, simply because you can keep diving for a, for a long, long time. And the more experience you get, the better, as in any sport. But again, the physical capabilities in swimming are somewhat different than in diving. So I think you're going to see a great team. Uh, I don't know if you're going to see the same team spirit, the same team effort. Mm -hmm. uh, again, there are no relays in diving or anything to the sort. Uh, but again, I, I hope to see a wonderful performance from all of our athletes, especially the diving team. I know someone has become a friend of all of ours who was uh, a champion divers here to work on the coverage of that. Jennifer Chandler just got to town a couple of days How ago. How do you say I love you again? <laughs> That's, I could have used that as a clue. Yet to bien le bleu. You can work on that, Steve. <laughs> Marianne, we have a full slate of activities coming up tomorrow too the diving the basketball women's basketball well, I'm really women's looking forward basketball to. tomorrow night folks don't miss this one that is going to um, <laughs> both teams are undefeated and this is for all all the marbles and here as a matter of fact up on the monitor is a listing of things that are coming up to us the rhythmic gymnastics the women's basketball both teams to explain that very quickly the ex we just dropped a piece of equipment in the studio. This is live from Moscow, in case you heard a little noise there. <laughs> Nobody's injured, and we're going to be okay. Just a slight accident. Minor dent. We'll repair it shortly. Also, men's basketball tomorrow ought to be a good one. Absolutely. Diving, as we told you, three-meter springboard. Cycling continues. Water polo. Steve was talking about that just a few minutes ago. The U.S. men's team, one of the favorites in the event. They got past Holland in their first match. We'll be covering water polo tomorrow. We hope you'll join us as we continue our coverage day six tomorrow of the Goodwill Games of 1986. For Marianne Laughlin, for Steve Lundquist, our entire crew, Daspadanya from Moscow.